Welcome back to Myth Vision, Dr. Joshua Bowen. Certainly happy to be back. I want to get your story. So it's subjective. It'll be from where you come from. You are a PhD uh, expert on a seriologist work. What was your specialty, just so we know? Yeah, so I, I specialized in uh, ancient Mesopotamian cultures, so uh, languages like Sumerian and Akkadian, reading all the cuneiform documents, all those. I, I specialized in literary and liturgical texts, but then I also minored in Hebrew Bible, and I took a ton of uh, archaeological courses. So I just wanted to f- wave that up front as you know something about the Bible, you know something about the ancient Near East, and where the Bible gets its material— and I want to dive into your childhood life. It, tell us who Joshua Bowen is. Hmm. I was born into a, a very conservative, fundamentalist, evangelical family. So, you know, like my, my grandparents on my mother's side were very fundamentalist, very, very conservative. My grandfather was a licensed minister in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, I think. But, you know. Paper skirts at the door and all, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And so really from as early as I can remember, the Bible was uh, the f- focus of my life. So my mother always tells the story about like by the time I was like 15 months old or something, I had memorized John 3.16. Like, and apparently it sounded, she does it. And like I said to Wild, you're a bad son. But, you know, it's, it's funny to hear her do it. But <clears throat> probably y'all didn't want to hear that. But, you know... The, the Bible and God and Jesus and like all of these things were the core of our everyday life. How serious would you say your mom and dad were in terms of upbringing you religiously? Like were they devout? You know, we have people who are on fire for Jesus or a Jesus freak. Are they, They're serious. Not just we go to church on Sunday, but they like live... Yeah. They wrestle with their own lives, but they really live a Christian life. Were your family like that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think they like distinguish that between like extrinsic and intri- intrinsic religiosity, I think. But like, yes, I mean, this was the intrinsic, like this was, was who they were to the core. Now, like my, my mother and father divorced when I was very young and they were obviously good conservative Christians, but they were not as dedicated, I wouldn't say. And my grandparents, that's who I spent a lot of my time with and really mo- most of my like, religious educa- education came from mm-hmm. like spending time with my grandparents so like my grandfather told me from a very early age and i have multiple sclerosis so my memory is getting worse and worse so like i i can remember fewer and fewer things so i guess it's good that we're doing something like i want to document it before you lose your memory right before i lose <laughs> my mind i'm an old coot but uh you know i was presented the gospel again from very very early on in hell you know hellfire and all and so one of the memories that i have is quite vivid actually is i remember sitting on um i had a bunk bed that i slept uh slept on the bottom bunk and i remember uh sitting on the bunk bed crying and i was like five or six like somewhere somewhere in there and my mother came in and said like you know what's what's wrong and i said well i've prayed to ask Jesus into my heart, you know, um, and for him, him to like forgive my sin, but I'm not sure that I did it right. And I don't want to go to hell. So I've asked him into my heart like 12 times just to make sure. And I remember having this conversation with my mother and then later with my grandfather about, you know, like if you truly meant it, you know, you, you, you're saved and, you know, Jesus is coming to your Holy Spirit's come in and Jesus has saved you. And your sins have been forgiven. And, but I mean, like, so, like I, I, at that age, I understood these concepts, right, to, to that degree. But, you know, ended up uh, going to, I mean, I moved around a lot. My parents divorced. And so I ended up moving from place to place, going to different schools. But, you know, when, when we could, I was, you know, put into private schools, into Christian schools. And, um, but we were church every week and on Wednesday. And uh, of course, I would have been the first to tell you that that doesn't make you a Christian, obviously. Right. But uh, it wasn't, we weren't going to church to like somehow earn salvation. It was because that's where our family was, you know, those like-minded believers and uh, others that had trusted in Christ. So our lives were very much focused on, you know, living out the salvation that we've been freely given. 
Right. So you're a devout fundamentalist Christian. Your parents are fundamentalist Christians, but they may not be as devout as your grandparents. You're a teenager. Uh, what would you say? Like you go through middle school, you go through high school. Are you like so serious about your faith? Like if you, on a scale from one to 10, where were you on how serious you were about Jesus? 13. You were extreme. Yeah. Um, like we, my sister and I, who's 15 months older than I am, in high school, I think I was probably in ninth grade, we were walking the neighborhood looking for people to present the gospel to. But that's what that, like, we thought these people are going to hell. We, we have to get the gospel to them. And like I, you know, went on a missions trip to Mexico when I was like 13, I think, or 14. You know, we it, all throughout high school, we were in church doing like the uh, in the youth group, active in the youth group. I ran the soundboard for the we called it Wednesday Night Live. I was always active in like skits that we would do or Carmen. You and me. Yeah, were talking that's about right. It. The Carmen skit um, champion. Yeah, champion. <laughs> He has won. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, like, listen to DC talk all the time and was so dismayed at whatever point it was that I found out that there was a rumor that they may have done marijuana, you know, and and it's, oh my gosh, how could, how could. The devil's lettuce. But, you know, in high school, I was called Jesus boy. I was beat up a lot because of it for for my faith. So suffered persecution as we expected that we would, you know. But, but in reality, like, like, I, I was, you know, the, the day of prayer, you, you go out front and you take that stand and you, know, you, you pray at the flagpole, meet me at the flagpole, that's what it was. And like, I remember dating people and like witnessing to them and then breaking up, <laughs> you know, can't imagine why. But it really was the, the core of who I was. Um, I want to emphasize the core of who you were, because I'll probably relate to you along the way. This is about you, but I might highlight things. Is part of who you were? Would you? Is it fair to say you were the kind of Christian who had their Bible in one hand, wearing an American uh, flag T-shirt? Were you extremely pro-military, very patriotic, extremely conservative in your politics, the whole nine? I mean, not that I was invested in politics enough i was just wanting to hang out with my friends at church you know but ethically uh, speaking but yes absolutely like um yeah, i was very very conservative and uh, i mean I, I hate to admit things like this but it's the truth like i didn't realize it, but i was incredibly racist right? i was incredibly bigoted i was the nicest horrible person hmm. right like i i cared for people but at the same time, I was just absolutely a bigot. I mean, there's just no, I don't, I don't know that there's two ways about that. And it's not that it was overt. It's not like I would like hate people or something overtly. But I mean, the way that I, I viewed people uh, through that conservative fundamentalist lens that I grew up with, right? And um, so I was just, I was just a bigoted person. And of course, I had heavy influences like we all do from, from family. And, you know, it, it was just... I was I was a really sweet, gentle, kind bigot. You had you were uh, your upbringing and your environment and the people, so we're breaking free of that. So you're a teenager, you're you're diehard Jesus freak, uh, almost like you have a better relationship with him than anybody has ever had, right? Because it's easy to get lost into your own mind. Were you planning on becoming someone like mm. in the ministry? Did you have hopes of being a real? deal or did you become a pastor what what happened with your life with jesus so my mother tells me that like at some point like around five or six or seven or something i i somebody asked me uh i I was in some sort of a public uh arena and i was at a microphone and they said like what do you want to be when you grow up and i said i want to be a missionary so and that that stayed with me right so i um i didn't do terribly well in high school Primarily because I spent most of my time at church uh, and didn't really care an awful lot about education, which is something that I think is unfortunately education is somewhat de-emphasized in, in many fundamentalist communities because like evolution is false. And so like science is of the devil and, and like, like this is this is something that there's a there's an anti intellectual mm-hmm. side of many fundamentalist communities. And so I didn't really put a lot of you know, emphasis there. 
And I just studied my Bible. Like I have, I still have my old King James Bible. It's got, it's well, well worn binding. Mine's uh, right up there somewhere. Yep. Yeah. I had notes everywhere. You know, I had memorized where things were on the pages. It was, yeah, of course, you know, I, uh, my goal was always to become a pastor or a missionary. Right. Uh, and of course, through high school, you're in youth group. And so naturally you want to be a youth pastor. Right. So everybody, at least I started like, uh, leading every once in a while, I'd get to lead the youth ministry message or whatever, or because they in training, right? I mean, you preach a sermon maybe, you know, once a year or something to the actual congregation. Like these were, because it's always like prepping you to try to get you comfortable. And so when I joined, uh, I joined the Air Force when I was 17 because I didn't do terribly well in school and I hadn't, hadn't really thought at all about how I was going to make a living outside of just being a, uh, a pastor. And of course, I hadn't done enough from a practical standpoint to be able to do that. And uh, so I, I just decided I was going to join the Air Force. Uh, I tried to join as a chaplain. Of course, I didn't realize you needed to become an officer to become a chaplain. I was not an officer. I didn't have a degree. So then I just joined under, like, uh, I became a, a communication and navigation radar person out on the flight line working on c5s in dover delaware but the moment that um i got to my first duty station in delaware i started my bible study right and i had become an x2 or an, an x9 dispensationalist by this point and like we can talk about that but it, it was a very narrow fundamentalist evangelical just we might as well for the sake of the audience because sometimes what's interesting about our testimonies is I'll mention full preterism. Yeah. Most people have no clue what that is. Yeah. And the ones that do are weirdos like me. And they know way too much about strange things that most Christians don't know about. So what is, I'll bite the bullet. <laughs> what is an Acts 9 dispensationalist, Josh? <laughs> right. um, so, you know, dispensationalism is sort of a way of, of viewing the Bible to understand things like, why is it that certain laws are given but they don't apply today, right? How does that work? Um, and that's one of the things that it, that it can do. And so basically it's this idea that God dispensed different rules, different regulations for different groups of people. And he didn't need to dispense those rules for all time. It could vary depending on the group. And so general, like normal dispensationalism would say that uh, God was dealing with the nation of Israel, even up through the Gospels, certainly in the Old Testament, but up through the Gospels. But there were hints, you know, that Jesus was was going to bring in something new. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, when, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, that that's when the church, the body of Christ, began. Well, we were way smarter than that, right? We knew that Acts 2 dispensationalism, those people are they're just lazy, right? They don't really understand the truth. And the truth uh, was that the dispensation of grace, this period of time that we're in right now, that didn't begin with uh, the, the apostles in Acts chapter 2. No, no, it started with the apostle Paul, right? And so uh, the apostle Paul is the one uh, that following the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, right? Saul is there holding the coats of the people that are stoning uh, Stephen. And Stephen, if you remember, looks up into heaven. He sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, this is like the Holy Spirit. This is, the sorry, the Son of Man, like, rising to judge, right? He's standing to judge the world for this gross sin of rejecting the Holy Spirit. But in his grace and in his mercy, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus reaches down and saves the leader of the rebellion, the apostle Paul, uh, or Saul, and changes him on the road to Damascus there into the apostle Paul. And through setting Israel aside temporarily, ushers in the dispensation of the grace of God, which Paul says in like places like Ephesians 3, it's been given to me, this dispensation, this mystery. And his message is salvation is by grace through faith alone. No works involved, right? There is no keeping of the law. There's, it's just God in his mercy has chosen to save everybody, including the Gentiles. And the reason that that was so important to us in our, in our way of thinking was that it's multifaceted. But from a prophetic standpoint, you know, you think of passages like Matthew 24, or you think about the prophets when they're talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and the coming tribulation period. 
you know, this is something that should have happened following Christ's earthly ministry, right? That that should have happened. And of course, preterists have a different way of understanding this. But for us, it was the prophetic timeline stopped ticking and was sort of like set on the shelf for a period of time. And, and this was done in God's mercy and in his grace. And so now all of the things that we're seeing, they're not part of this Old Testament prophetic timeline. They're in this dispensation of the grace of God. So like I used to draw it out, a little circle for the earth, uh, talking about creation, and then this timeline. And I'd go through, I had this whole 16 episode Bible study. I've still got it on cassette somewhere. But uh, it, it ends with the crucifixion of Christ. And then a short period after that for the ascension and uh, you know up to the stoning of Stephen. And then the calling of the apostle Paul starts this little capacitor looking thing. It's this two vertical lines that have a gap in between. And I used to write D-O-G, dispensation of grace, right? And that's where we are today. Who knows how long it's going to be? We don't know. But what is it going to end with? It's going to end with the rapture of the church. So the whole Tim LaHaye thing, right? Mm -hmm. Left Behind series, when the rapture happens, as we see in 1 Thessalonians 4, I promise I will wrap this up soon. Sorry, you're like, shut up, Josh. Uh, I but, would never. But, <laughs> but once the rapture happens, that's going to take all of the members of the body of Christ out of here. And it's going to start the prophetic clock ticking again. Then very quickly, the seven-year tribulation is going to start. Time of Jacob's troubles, only to end with the coming of Christ and the millennial kingdom being ushered in. And uh, and then, of course, the eternity of eternities after that. Now you're saved. just want to let you know that. <laughs> right. But that's... And I'll, I'll give this very, very quick wrap-up. There was the, the, like the type of mid-Acts dispensationalist I was as you can probably tell, we valued being different. We valued having smaller numbers because it was like this really this sort of Gnostic idea. Mm -hmm. We have... We're elect. Yeah. We have this... Yeah. yeah. Um, and we used to tell this joke once I kind of got out of that really narrow, there's a... There's a I don't want to say it because they'd hate me for it, but like a more liberal version of mid-axe dispensationalism and they would tell this joke or they'd say uh you know a, a guy is standing on a bridge at night looking up at the stars and another guy walks up behind him and stands at the rail with him and says man isn't it isn't it beautiful what our creator has made and the guy looks over at him and says are, are, are you a christian he says yeah i am and he goes me too and so they shake hands and uh, he says well let me let me ask you a question are you a like, are you a Protestant or, or a Catholic? And they say, well, I'm a, I'm a Protestant. Say, me too. And so they hug. And, uh, and the guy says, sorry, let me ask you, are you, a, are you like a covenant theologian or are you a dispensationalist? And the guy kind of says, well, I'm, I'm a dispensationalist. He says, I can't, so am I. And so they exchange numbers. And uh, he says, well, okay, here, let me ask you this. Are you, a, are you an Acts 2 dispensationalist or a, an Acts 9 dispensationalist as well? I'm an Acts 9. So, I can't believe this. So am I. And so they exchange uh, uh, or they set up a time for their kids to play together. And as they're walking along, the phrase says, well, let me ask you this. Do you think the 12 apostles are in the body of Christ or out of the body of Christ? And the guy says, well, I, I think they're in the body of Christ. He says, you heretic. And he pushes him off the bridge. Oh. And that's how it was, right? It's like the huddle. We'd all huddle up. And then we'd look around and say, now, where do we disagree? And then we'd get rid of that guy now we're smaller now where do we disagree that's how it was i love going down these little rabbit trails because they they tell you how crazy we were <laughs> okay <laughs> i mean it. it's really good to know that because it tells me what you thought where your worldview was at how how your brain operated i know that experience i was dispensationalist myself not Acts 9 dispensationalist, but I don't know what kind... I know. I wasn't a real Christian. Well, even. I know. I know. But we're, we're journeying, right? So yeah. you, you've given a few sermons. I've, I've seen video footage of you actually preaching. You're like the legit deal of trying to go down the path and do the right thing following Jesus and whatnot. Where in this journey... Do you recall any doubts? I mean, there's people you're going to bump into in your life that plant little seeds to make you think about them. Later on in life, you reflect about them. But I guess as we're leading up to what eventually happens, because you're no longer in Christianity, I want to kind of get like 
you're giving sermons, you're really in the church, you go to college. Mm-hmm. What, what, what happens to you? Education? So now you're learning more. You have to expose yourself to more. What's happening? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess the, the place to start is, you know, when I started teaching those Bible studies in the Air Force, the, what I mean by that was I went and bought a 3 by 5 marker board and an easel, and I would uh, print out flyers, like, you know, Wednesday in such and such building, nine day room or whatever, come to a Bible study. And I'd pass them around the squadron and I'd talk to my friends and then I'd go in there and I'd, I'd set up my easel and I'd, I'd wait and nobody would come. But I'd sit there for the 45 minutes, wait just in case somebody came and then I'd pack up my easel and I'd walk back to my room and I'd be really, you know, sad and dis- disheartened. I'd call my grandfather and I'd say, nobody came again this week. And he'd say, hey, God honors your faithfulness, right? Stay above board. That was the thing he always said to me. Stay above board, right? God has called you to do this. Just just keep at it. He'll, you know, he's going to do what he wants to do with this. If nobody comes, there's a reason and that's okay. You just, you do what God has called you to do. And so I did. And eventually, like we started getting people on it or eventually worked up to something like 13 people were coming weekly to this Bible study. I, th- I think I think it's important for me to say this because I know as you do, there are going to be people watching this that are Christians that are saying you never were a Christian, mm-hmm. right? So, so I'm never going to convince that person that I was because they're going to look at this and say, well, first John tells me that you walked away from the faith. So of course, you know, I know that you weren't, you, you went out from among us because you were never of us. So there you go. End of story. But I'm going to make it harder for them um, because I'm going to quickly, if you don't mind, explain what I understood the salvation, the message of salvation to be, what the gospel was. So if somebody were to ask me, hey, what do I have to do to be saved? I would say you have to realize that you were a sinner, that you are a sinner, that you're a sinner not because of necessarily the sin that you've done, but because you're uh, in the line of Adam. And Adam, when he sinned in the Garden of Eden, brought sin into this world, Romans 5.12, right? So, uh, for by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. Therefore, death has passed to all men, for all have sinned. So, you know, uh, this isn't something that you sin because you're a sinner, not the other way around. You have a sin nature, and there's no way that under this circumstance that a holy, perfect God can have sin in his presence. He just can't, right? And so, under that circumstance, we're all under judgment. Right. And there's nothing that we can we can't do anything to get rid of our sin nature. Right. We can't atone for our own sin. We can't do it. So we were we were just in a bad place under judgment into that scenario. Jesus Christ, God came down in the flesh, Philippians two, six and seven, and humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, God incarnate, the the God man, the hypostatic union of Christ, right? The theanthropic person and being fully God, yet fully man, still, you know, very much obviously a part of the triune God, um, a distinct person, but with the same essence, he limited his power uh, through the kenosis, right? In Philippians two and took on this form of a servant and died paying uh, on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin and all sins that were past, all sins in the future. He took all of it upon himself on uh, Calvary and and was buried, but rose again the third day, showing his power over sin um, and doing so so that we, as as he was the first fruits, we could also be resurrected in, in the fullness of life. How do we get that justification imputed to our account? It's nothing that we do. There are no good works. Our works are as filthy rags. Instead, what we had to do, what this person in front of me had to do, was to say, I'm a sinner. There's nothing that I can do. But Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection paid the full penalty for my sin and rose showing his power uh, 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 over sin so that I might be justified. And if I simply trust in his finished work on the cross, then God uh, uh, forgives me of my sin, imputes the very righteousness of Christ to my account so that when God sees me, he doesn't see me anymore. He sees the righteousness of Christ. That gives me a position in Christ where I am justified. Now, from that, the Holy Spirit comes to live within me. I'm sealed under the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. From that point on in my life, I have this position in Christ. I am in Christ. I'm perfect as far as God is concerned. But that's my justified state. Uh, or position. 
where I am in life is I'm sanctified, but my sanctification, I'm my job is to not for salvation, not for anything salvific, but I'm to try to bring my sanctified state to meet where my justified position is. But again, that's 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 not me doing that for salvation. It's because uh, of what Christ had done that I should desire to do these things. And that's what salvation was. So that's what I believe. Right? So you and you accepted that. You confessed that. You believed that. A hundred and ten percent. And you lived that. Yeah. So if I were flipping it around on you, and we're getting to your conclusion later here, but this is a point. Would you say that, like, obviously you would say you were saved. Yeah. Oh, of course. But if someone came along and actually, let's just say an angel from God came down and said, hey, um, you know, you're not really saved. Um, you said all the right things, but you're not really saved. Like, the spirit really isn't in you. You thought it was. You thought you were really, like, assessing that, how would you react to that? Would you say, this has got to be Satan? Like, there's, like... How would you explain that to yourself when you are fully convinced you were saved? Yeah, I mean, in the hypothetical, if I know that, that this actually is a messenger of God and that I guess in this circumstance, like maybe I'm not, maybe I should be a Calvinist or something, right? Uh, like I would fall to my knees and say, what must I do then to be saved? Because here's what I've understood. But you're coming from God. like right. you, you, so, so, so yes, but if I didn't know that right. and this was just the spirit and I could think... I mean, I would test the spirit then and be like, well, I mean, gosh, like I'm looking at God's word. I'm looking at what the Bible says. Like, well, I mean, I like I'm trying to get to the heart of that, what you're describing right here, because my question just hypothetically for the Christian that you simply are trying to address that might think you weren't. Yeah. What was that? Was that Satan? Was that a demonic force? Oh, he <laughs> oh, he tried, but he was a seed that fell in the cracks. It's not like Josh wasn't trying to everything you had you really gave everything all your knowledge all your energy your whole life you're really giving all that we have to give in terms of how can one know that they are saved right it's only christ works you put that trust that faith that hope in him and so but i would have said none of that matters i would have said none of my trying none of my efforts right right i in fact here's the example that i used to give um so I guess I'm skipping skipping ahead a little bit here. I became a, a pastor of a church out in Virginia, and I started to do jail ministry. And one of the examples that I used to give when I talk to people in jail is I would say, look, let, let's imagine that you've got a life sentence, right? Uh, or you've got a death sentence, and you're on death row, and you're sitting here, and two more months, and you're gonna be you're gonna be executed. But I get word, I'm your, you know, I'm the chaplain, but I get word that something has happened, like the governor has pardoned you, right? And so much so that you are now free. You're free to leave this prison, right? But this is a maximum security prison. And there are, there are people stationed at, you know, at the exits with, you know, at machine guns or whatever. And like, they're gonna, they're gonna kill anybody that tries to escape, right? So, you know, there's a, there, there are guards stationed at the exits. They've got machine guns. They're going to kill anybody that tries to escape. And, of course, you know that as the maximum security prisoner. And I come in, and I don't have any evidence, right? I, I don't have any paper. I just, like, I, you just, you, you have to trust me. And I say to you, hey, listen, I just got off the phone with the governor. You're free. You can walk out of this prison. Come on. Like, we can go out together. Like, you can leave, but you don't believe me. Are you free? Well, I mean, like, yeah. Has your, have you been pardoned? Is the, like, is the debt paid? Yeah. But is it being applied to your life? No. Because you're sitting here in prison. Well, what if I add, because you're afraid. I, I, I don't trust you, right? I don't believe you. Those guards are going to kill me if I go out there, right? You're free. Like, it's been taken care of, but you stay in jail. Well, let's add a level to this. What if I say, listen, they're going to demolish this prison. I know you're sitting here in the hole. You're in maximum security, so you don't know this, but they're getting ready. Part of the this this pardon is just like the, 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 everybody else is gone. I know you don't see them, but they're all gone. They're going to destroy this building tomorrow. You have to come with me. Now, I'm sorry, man. I just, I don't see the evidence. I just, I just don't believe it. And I said, you know me. We grew up together. I would not lie to you. Come on, man. We got to get out of here. You're free. 
you've been pardoned and you're going to die. You don't believe me. And so that free gift doesn't get imputed to your account, right? It's not a perfect analogy, but I think it was pretty good mm -hmm. for, for what I was doing. And like, that's how I would have described salvation. And so like, I guess, I guess the, the, the point here that I'm trying to make is that this was, I knew that I was saved because I trusted in what the Bible said, right? I believed it. For anybody watching that identifies with what I've said thus far, think about this. If in five years time or in two years time, you become an agnostic, you become an atheist, think back to how you believe right now. Because people that are in your shoes, your colleagues right now will say you never really believed. And how would that feel? It's, it's weirder than that now that I'm not a believer. And I want to get to that point yeah. where, where your story tells. But it's weirder than that since you wanted to break the fourth wall and discuss directly with the audience and, and go beyond. Because I was wanting to kind of get that same audience that might go, oh, he was never really, they throw that theological thing out there to then try to explain then what was that? Yeah. What is this? Yes. So the question is, right. so what? You theologically can't say you're a Christian because you're no longer one now and because you never really were one. What was that? Did Satan trick you? Did God actually allow you to think that you were really a yeah, Christian, a you point. spent all that time sincerely promoting him, his word, the truth of his message, et cetera, et cetera. I'm putting in quotation marks. What was that, the devil the whole time? Yeah. How could God sit back and watch you sincerely try that hard, that sincere? And I'm speaking to myself here. Yeah. And sit here and go, eh, yeah, you never really were. What kind of God is that? Yeah. If your God is the true God, yeah. you know, and so that's, I'm wanting to throw the ball back and just yeah. go, you're going to tell me, oh, it's just that simple hand wave, Mr. Christian, Mrs. Christian, just hand wave Josh's entire testimony. You were never one of us. It's so funny because one day, some of those, like you're yeah. saying, will be agnostic, atheist, or theist that are not Christian. Yeah, exactly. And look at this and go, you were never how listening. stupid. I didn't even think to think like this. Yeah. So... Anyway, we broke the fourth wall. I really wanted to do that. Continuing in your story, though, I want to get to a point where doubts come in, but maybe you first have to go, I started to educate. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people start to learn yeah. as devout Christians, and then their world expands, yeah. and it's so big that yeah. they realize this bubble I was living in. Like, Remember the movie Bubble Boy? Mm. Did you ever watch that movie? No. If you haven't, just a nutshell... It's a guy in a bubble. His mom teaches him from infancy that if he gets outside of that bubble because he has these certain illnesses or whatever, uh, she convinces him. He has his phobias and these illnesses and anything. That bubble keeps him alive. If that bubble ever pops and he ends up outside of it, he will die. And he cannot survive this world without this bubble. So he's rolling around as a grown-ass man <laughs> with this bubble, this plastic bubble. And it's fun. The movie's great. At some point later in the movie, it pops, and he thinks, I'm dead, but he, does, he doesn't die. Mm -hmm. And you realize, oh, my gosh. It's almost like the uh, Adam Sandler Waterboy movie. He's uh. like, foosball's the devil. <laughs> right. And then he finds out, foosball's not the devil, ma. Right. And, and I love her. And, you know, and I, I tried. I tried to reenact him. <laughs> You get the point. So Al alligators is hungry because yeah. they got all them teeth and no toothbrush. <laughs> the Abdullah Amangara. <laughs> so I yeah joined the service when I was seventeen. I served on, on active duty for six years as an aircraft mechanic, and then I I still wanted to become a chaplain. So during that time, I uh, went distance learning in my off time uh, to Liberty University because it was good fundamentals, the evangelical school. And I got my bachelor's in science and religion. And that, that bachelor's of science allowed me to apply for uh, the chaplain program. And so I got commissioned as a second lieutenant in 2003 and transitioned over into the reserves and started going to seminary full time. And I went to Capital Bible Seminary, which is another fundamentalist evangelical school. And my focus was on the languages. Like I just did the languages. Greek and Hebrew, of course, but then Aramaic and 
like studied Syriac and some Ugaritic, uh, I took different types of uh, Aramaic, I took an Akkadian class. Like that, I was really, really into this, right? It, why did you do that? I don't want to get lost, but did, was it, I want to know what the Lord, I want to speak and know what Jesus spoke and knew. Well, it's more that my, of course, our view of inerrancy was that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God down to the, the very letters, right? The grammatical forms, of course, in the autographs. Whatever that means now, by the way. Um, but uh, so, you know, understanding really aspects of like the wider ancient Near Eastern culture and those, that wasn't really on my radar too terribly much because I, I had the Bible, right? And so I had the original, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic. And uh, so that's what I needed. And so I just spent all six years of my master's degree full-time 126 semester hour master's degree just doing tons and tons and tons of language uh, work i taught the last two years that i was there i taught the the graduate hebrew cycle so taught grammar one and two and then i taught hebrew readings and then exegetical principles like it was it was my thing during that time i got a position as an associate pastor at a church out in virginia so i was going to school full-time and pastoring and like I, I remember toward the end, uh, a professor came up to me, Dr. Mook was his name, and he said, Josh, I don't say this to many people, but there aren't many people that have, and I don't remember the word that he used, but it was sort of like the tenacity, I guess, to get a PhD. But you you need to get a PhD. You need to go for that. And so I remember talking to my now ex-wife and saying, hey, Tara, like, what, what do you think? And like, she said, well, you... Because I, I applied to Baltimore Hebrew University and um, talked to, I took an ulpan there, a modern Hebrew language course. And because uh, I spoke modern Hebrew at the, at the time reasonably well. Uh, and I remember uh, Barry Gitlin was the president there at the time. And they were getting ready to merge with Towson State. And he said, look, I'd love to to bring you in. Like you have a real, I had, a, I had a, like a four point to GPA or something. They had a 4.3 system at Capital. So I was doing I was doing really well. And he said, I'd love to have you come, but we just, I can't take new students right now. We're going through this transition. So I was so distraught. Like, what am I going to do? And my ex said, well, why don't you apply to Johns Hopkins? And I was like, yeah, why don't I apply to NASA while we're at it? You know, like I have just as good a chance of getting into NASA as I have getting into Johns Hopkins. But for whatever reason, uh, like, I, I, I got a spot at, at Johns Hopkins in the Assyriology program. I remember that I was teach. I'd resigned at that point from the, the pastoral position because there's no way I was going to be able to be a pastor and go to do a PhD full time. I remember talking to the dean uh, as I was leaving, teaching my final Hebrew course. And, I was, you know, I was carrying all my books out that I used to, to help me teach. And I had my my Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart, Stuttgart Gensia in my hand, my biblical uh, Hebrew Bible, big thick thing. And uh, he said, "So, got into Johns Hopkins. It's a pretty liberal school. Like, you ready? You know, you're gonna face some challenges up there." And I said, "You know, I know I always tell this story, but I, it's vivid, right?" I said, um, "You know, I I I, I know I'm I'm going into the lion's den." I held up my Hebrew Bible. I said, "But I'm gonna win souls for Christ." So that was my attitude, leaving seminary and going into Johns Hopkins. I, you asked the question, did I ever have doubts? Like I knew my savior, right? Right. And like the idea that when problems came up and not that they really did, because I, 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 I really didn't entertain them, but like problems with, you know, God being immoral or something that wasn't even really a thing for me because like God's ways are higher than our ways. Read Isaiah 55. Let's move on. You know, or something like evolution. You know, my my response was, look, I am not very good at science because I didn't really pay attention in high school. But, <laughs> you know, even if the earth looks like it's billions of years old, right? like Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were created with apparent age. They didn't look 12 seconds old. They looked like 30 years old, right? So the earth would have looked... Like it had a parent age. So like all of those things I could just, you know, did, it just wasn't an issue for me. It was at Johns Hopkins that I, I had my like first real confrontation. So we need to get into that because that's usually when rubber hits the road in these are what happened. 
And no matter what you say, breaking the fourth wall, some people will go, ugh, and not accept some of the doubts that came up for you along the way. Can you remember any distinct? It's usually not one argument. It's usually not one thing that breaks us. It's usually a build-up, cumulative thing that occurs that makes us start to ask ourselves questions and look inside. What happened to you? What was said? What was the arguments that started to chip away your armor? So... I you know, like I took a couple of classes when I was in seminary that could be categorized like apologetics classes. Like how do we explain Jonah being in the belly of the big fish, you know, or all that stuff. But like really those things were not of interest to me because I knew the Bible was the inspired and errant word of God and I trusted it. Like that so like these things, like a Q gospel, it just it, it wasn't relevant to me because I, I had the truth. That stuff was just not gonna shake me. That's why I focused on the languages so much, because that's that's what I cared about, because uh, the other things didn't really bother me. So when I got to Hopkins, uh, I was still interviewing and like meeting some of the grad students. And a friend of mine, Andrew, a good friend of mine now, you know, I, I, I was talking to him and he was kind of you know, getting to know me. And he said, oh, OK, so, so you're an evangelical. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, this will be interesting. What do you mean? He said, well, we'll just see how long it lasts. And I was like, huh. Yeah, well, get ready to get disappointed. You know, inside I'm thinking, well, you know, you're going to be the first person I'm going to try to lead to Christ, right? And he, like, he identified as a Christian, right? Like, went to a Protestant church, you know, but he just wasn't a real Christian, right? Of course. Um, he wasn't a ninth, Acts 9. Uh, right, anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Heretic, push him off the bridge. No, but he said, well, this this will be interesting. And so uh, I started taking classes. And, you know, when I, I gave my testimony, my deconversion story, in a video several years ago and i said you know somebody asked me how long it took like how long was my deconversion process and i answered about 45 minutes and it's it's good that, like that's true but it's true from a certain perspective so i i I'll, I'll try to develop it here so i started taking courses and i was taking um of course hebrew courses hebrew readings we were going through the book of kohelet Ecclesiastes. Uh, we were also going through uh, epigraphy, old, old Hebrew inscriptions, and uh, and I was taking this history cycle, the history of Syria Palestine. So going through all the history of the region, starting back in like the third millennium. And uh, on top of that, I was like reading these Sumerian and Akkadian literary texts. So these ancient flood stories. You know, I was taking five courses at a time and like studying. 70 hours a week, 60, 65, 70 hours a week. I mean, it was crazy the, the amount of time I was spending studying. At every turn, it was like, wait, like this doesn't seem to match up with like what I know very well about the history that's presented in the Bible. But at each, you know, at each turn, I was like, yeah, but I mean, come on, like, like something's wrong here. The, the information they're giving me can't be right. So I remember when we were learning about the Habiru, and I was like, wait, there's this like, th- that sounds a lot like... You know, and then, of course, they brought up that it, people have argued for a connection with the word Ivri in Hebrew. And so I was like, well, couldn't this mean just like ancient Israelites? Like, is, isn't that possible? So I'm, even here, I'm trying to like rationalize it in my head. Like, come on, like th- there's got to be a good answer here. But it just it at every turn, it was like, man, this this does not fit with, you know. And so this took maybe like half the semester, half of the first semester. But it was intense. I mean, intense every day all the subjects that i was studying fit into this category of having to face you know a lot of my fundamentalist beliefs about history it's throwing out a few more just to get the audience on the same page i'm wondering and let me know the earlier flood myths you mentioned in passing but this you you realize you know they're older yeah. like the textual data for the bible you would have to make this assumption that somehow orally it's been kept and finally gets written down way, 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 thousands of years after the flood happens. Thousands. I mean, three, four thousand years after Noah, you know, you get this written down in this book. What's more plausible? What's more likely? You're dealing with the material data that's right. older than the Bible. And I'm looking at this. Like I'm reading Atrahasis. I'm reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. In its I'm, original languages. Yeah. I'm like, and I'm, I'm reading through the Sumerian. Of course, at, at this point, I'm still learning Sumerian and Akkadian. But like I'm reading as I'm translating through it. I'm reading it in English. And I'm like... Like, like what this is 
But I again, like you, you, you can you can rationalize those things for a while, right? So you're are you not you don't see them as co- you're trying to make your cognitive dissonance in a way, but you're like yeah. it's clear this is the same as this, right? These right. two are connected. Yeah. Um, and but I remember one class in um, the history of Syria Palestine. We had just taken time and studied through the Amarna period, which is devastating to the Exodus traditional exodus view like my rationalizations were starting to run out and i remember we got to the late bronze age collapse like the fall the end of the late bronze age and we started studying the sea peoples and i learned about the peleset and the peleset were the philistines and that 45 minute class was like the straw that broke the camel's back for me and what it did is it put a chink in the armor and the moment that happened because of my fundamentalist evangelical view if one thing is wrong, inerrancy goes out the window. If there's no way that I can figure out how this can be right, it all goes out. And what it did is it it just, it made me take a step back. Because all of that stuff leading up through the semester, like if that was wrong, well, maybe all of these things are wrong too. And if that's the case, let me just take a step back here. And not that I went in those terms, but that's what happened is I just took a step back and I said, I mean, the thing that best explains this is that, and if this is just another ancient Near Eastern set of texts, like, is it that of necessity, right? Like, did I say, well, this proves Christianity wrong or something? Well, it proved my version of Christianity wrong as far as I was concerned, because it's historically, this historical grammatical hermeneutic, this inerrancy inspiration view that I had was like, nothing can be wrong historically. But that doesn't, like, I remember my friend Mark Zimmerman, who went through a seminary with me, like, he was coming up every week. I had a lot of anxiety being in the city, Baltimore. (laughs) <laughs> and he would come up and he would take me out every Thursday evening to dinner at Uno's Pizzeria. We'd go out, we'd have a pizza. He was such a great friend. Uh, and we'd walk around this parking lot or walk around Ellicott City and we'd get a coffee. And we'd just talk about all the things I was struggling with. And each week, it was like he was trying to like, pull me back from the edge. And he would say, okay, all right, let's assume for a second that the fundamentalist view of the text, that, that we have to change our view of inerrancy, right? Isn't that possible? Maybe, maybe there are updates or maybe there are things that got wrong and we just have to change how we view, in, view inerrancy. And my response would always be, yeah, but I mean, like, it seems like a better explanation then is that these are just ancient texts that men wrote. So it wasn't the case that I was saying, aha, this like deductively proves Christianity wrong. I still don't hold to that position. I don't think that, my wife is a Christian, so I don't think that it disproves Christianity. I think what it does is it necessitates that Christianity have to take a different model. It can't hold to this inerrancy view, certainly not the one that I held to. That's what did it. I want to probe this for a moment psychologically because you have a lot of Christian apologists. We love to address and like tackle bad arguments and debunk ridiculous claims and also highlight things Christian apologists want to avoid. But another one that I hear a lot of Christian apologists love to latch on to, and it's not just the apologist, but Christians in general, often times, mostly apologists will say stuff like, well, notice you were an evangelical fundamentalist. You just traded one extreme for the other and became an atheist. Yep. Right? I'm not here to defend atheism or your conclusion that there may not be a God or you don't think there is. But I do want to get into the mindset as to why we went from that instead of just landing on liberal Christianity for 12 more years before we finally go, did I even need this? Some people do that. But for us, we went evangelical. Your description of the gospel, it's going to sound derogatory, but I don't mean it. We were nuts for Jesus. Mm. Obsessed. Jesus freaks, right? 100%. So you go from that, and now you realize you were told not truths. Yeah. You were told and it uplifted everything about your worldview. I want to like I want to probe that a little with you Josh to kind of get why we can go from that to that. And for me, I'm going to go to bat for guys like this for a second here and say to my liberal Christian friends who go, "Ah, you just went, you know, 
You should have tried orthodoxy. You should have tried, you know, Roman Catholicism. I've heard that we're way more sophisticated and we accepted Genesis 1 through 11 as an as a mythic, sure. you know, and, and and good for you guys. Yeah. But once we found out that that wasn't true, as extreme as we were about Jesus, we were ready to go as extreme and really dissecting the truth. Yeah. You told us a false good. Well, guess what? I want to know, did Jesus even really rise from the dead? Hmm. What about the other surrounding cultural or mythic God men that claim to be alive after death, have ascension narratives? The list goes on. I'm making yeah. a point. Yeah. They're not venturing into that. They're totally comfortable. They're in this like cozy middle ground yeah. where it's lukewarmish, in my yeah. opinion. They weren't hot for it. Yeah. So I didn't know one way or the other. And when I did that, that's what led me. Do you feel that I'm speaking for you in a way when I say that? Or what is your personal? I don't know if you've ever dated someone. You know, you notice something seems off, right? Or if you if you watch a TV show and, uh, you know, like the, the, the guy does something that leads his girlfriend to say, like, I don't, I don't think you're like being faithful to me, right? You, you're coming in kind of late here. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. No, I totally see why it seems that way, but let me explain why, right? So actually I've, I've had to work late here. You know, we've, we've got this other thing going on. Oh, I'm, okay. That makes sense. Right. And the next week you, you smell like perfume, right? Yeah, I know. I totally get it. Right. Yeah. It makes sense why you would think that I'm cheating on you. But no, I promise I'm not, right? Uh, there's this woman that sits right next to me in the cubicle. Oh, my goodness, she sprays on a lot of perfume, right? So that's why I smell like perfume. Oh, okay. I mean, that, that makes sense, right? You know, next week, there's like lipstick on his collar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. It really looks like it. I, You know, my mother came uh, to uh, to see me at work, and uh, like I think she, she slipped, and she must have gotten some lipstick. She wears a lot of lipstick, you know. Individual things that seem out of place come up over a period of time, spread out. It's easy to form an apologetic argument that explains it away. So following this, I can, I can, that guy could keep coming in late after he's made that first explanation about why he's late coming home. He's already explained and she's already considered reasonable. Yeah, he's working late. So that's why he's not coming home on time. Then the perfume, right? Like that, after he explains that the next week he could have perfume on, it's fine because he gets that lady in the cubicle. Oh my gosh, I can't stand it. Now imagine that he comes home late, he smells like perfume, and he's got lipstick on his collar all at once. It's a lot harder to get somebody to believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had to stay late with this woman who smells a lot like perfume and she tripped and you know, my mother came and like, in other words, when it's all at once, it's a lot harder to think, yeah, that's possible because you have to have three or four or 10. Yeah, it's possible that explanations. Whereas when you get them one at a time, particularly in a controlled environment, it's easier to say, yeah. So then when it comes up again, you go, yeah, yeah, but I've already dealt with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've already dealt. I'll only have to deal with this one. Right. That's what I think happens with people that say things to me and to you like, well, you should have tried liberal Christianity or you should have tried like, you know, like we hear this all the time, like, yeah, I don't believe in like a literal creation story or like a literal worldwide flood. I think that this is like it's describing a much smaller event or a localized event or it's it actually these are, you know, the, the, the 600,000 fighting men. Actually, this is only like a, a small unit of men. And so when you go to a school that focuses on apologetic arguments, particularly a school that is really good at dealing with the ancient Near Eastern context and literature, in this controlled environment with professors that you trust, they can massage it through. They can bring this one. Okay, let's deal with why the Genesis narrative looks like Atrahasis. Okay, let's, do, let, let's just deal with that. And if you can do that, the, it, it allows you over time, well, we've already dealt with that. Well, we've already dealt with that. Well, we've already dealt with that, right? So then you see this all the time when somebody, you know, you go in clubhouse or something or you listen to a debate and somebody says, well, look here, um, Nebuchadnezzar is not uh, Belshazzar's father. Immediately, you can see it in their eyes if they've worked on the book of Daniel at all. They're like, yeah, but you don't understand Semitic words. Well, because father can also mean grandfather, right? 
they have settled that in their mind. Well, like that's just a small possibility. But if you take it one at a time, it's, it's a substantial enough possibility because really all you need is a possibility mm-hmm. to answer the question. And then once it's answered, it's behind you. I've already answered that. I've already dealt with that. And so that leads, that can lead to things like, yeah, but, but he wasn't his grandfather either, right? So sure, it's possible that it means grandfather here, but Nebuchadnezzar wasn't his grandfather either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like Nera Glisser married, you know, one of the daughters of Nebuchadnezzar. And so it's possible that Nabonite is also married. Like now you're going, is it possible that it's possible that it's possible, mm-hmm. right? You're like three possibilities in. Whereas if I were to give you in a controlled environment with professors that you trust all of this data at once and you i have to like i have to look at my professors and go i mean i think you know about the amarna period right i think you know about the archaeology of the late bronze age like i think you know about iron one like and they do (laughs) right um that all of these things coming at once makes it very very difficult to say coming home late, smelling of perfume and having lipstick on your collar. I can't explain all those away right now. Like that's real. That's And it makes me take a step back and say, is it necessarily true that he's cheating on me? No, it's possible that he's coming home with reasonable explanations. What's the simplest, easiest? This is exactly what happened to Bart Ehrman. Yeah. And just, he mentioned he was working overtime, exhausting into this thing in the Gospel of Matthew, I think it was, or Mark. And then, like, Jesus quoted something, and it was about somebody in the Old Testament, and there, it wasn't accurate. Yeah. Like, and he's trying to make it work so that the lipstick and the perfume and the this and then finally he goes to his professor i think it's bruce metzger at the time it might have been someone else and he just was like look at this i mean did they do the isn't job? this brilliant yeah and he's like couldn't the gospel of mark have just made a mistake and it, it exploded his brain like why have i been doing this and really what is the motive we're trying to defend like I would a parent, a brother, a sibling, like something that's so important, a yeah. spouse, a child, you're going to defend them even if they're wrong. And this is the key, right? This is the key. I think that even my evangelical friends today, because at, like at Hopkins, I had a very good evangelical friend. We're still very good friends now, but we were connected at the hip all seven years that we were together at Hopkins. We would have these, we'd be translating Sumerian together in the library at four in the morning or whatever, or five in the morning. And I like I'd take a break and I'd look up at him and I'd say, like, how do you like how do you how do you know Jesus is real, man? Like how like how do you know that you're really saved? How do you know that Jesus was God and that God has saved you? And like I, I had a personal experience with Jesus Christ, man. I would say, Well, how do you how do you know it wasn't Enki? How do you know it wasn't, you know, Enlil? That that was that he said, Well, I just know, right? And I think that this is sort of the point, is that when when apologists come to problems in the text, they're not coming at it from a neutral standpoint. Mm-hmm. They're not, right? They're coming at it in the same way that when you watch the show Monk, you know, Monk is this detective that, just like every other detective show, like there are always these crazy impossible murders that take place and for all the world it looks like the person that monk identifies in the beginning of the episode as the murderer there's no way he could have committed that crime he was in outer space for goodness sake at the time right and monk says he did it because you've watched the show you know that he's right and so all you need in the show is the mere possibility that it could have happened. So, so like, you'll accept he had a, a radio signal that he sent. Uh, a, a perfect example is Monk finds, they find this woman who's uh, the wife of a radio disc jockey, a radio talk show host or something, is dead in her bedroom, having died from propane. I guess it was propane, but some sort of gas from the fireplace. And... She'd accidentally turned the the knob on and forgot to light the pilot. And so all the gas just came in and she laid down and she died. At the time of the murder or of her death, 
the guy is live on the air doing a radio show, like an hour on either side or something. Impossible. There's no way he could have done it. Monk says he did. So you know he did. You trust the show. Right. And so it turns out that he trained the dog every day to respond to a voice command over the radio, <laughs> knowing that the radio would be on next door, and it was the next door neighbor's dog, and he trained him to go and turn the, the gas on, right? And so he said this command over the air during that radio show, and the dog heard it, ran up, turned it on, killed her. The mere possibility was all you needed as the as the viewer. And that's what Christian apologetics is, because you're not coming to this saying, you know, the best explanation for this is that Av means grandfather here in Daniel, and actually Neraglisser, because Neraglisser did, that means Nabonidus must have. That's the most reasonable explanation. Right. No, you're saying, I believe that this is the inspired and errant word of God, and I trust God, therefore, ha- can I find a possible explanation? Mm. That's good enough for me. So you're looking at Genesis and you see it. It's 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 a later myth that is reworking earlier myths. You expert you have an expertise in this and you know this. I love the all of these examples that you've given and I want to focus just saying Jesus, right? The New Testament talks about he rose. It says things that look really strange and fishy by the author saying Jesus said he's going to rise, all of this stuff. And you have these critical scholars who come in and go, you know, something looks fishy about these Gospels. They don't even agree with each other on several points. They do contradict on issues. You start seeing it. You don't work around it. You don't go, well, Monk said. You go, mm, something doesn't look right. I don't have that I trust Monk conclusion. Um, that's what the authors really want you to do. I mean, they, they write so that they convince you. Some of the Gospels literally say, I'm writing this so that, you know, you will be convinced. And I wrote an article uh, on academia.com, my only article that I wrote, on minimal doubts argument. Hmm. I reversed the minimal facts argument and showed in the New Testament, my whole thing was, we should doubt. And the reason is, even the earliest eyewitness supposed people who saw the risen Jesus in some way, the 1 Corinthians 15 list, According to the Gospels, the disciples themselves doubted. And I'm not talking about before Jesus died and rose. I'm saying Matthew 28 has them on the mountain in Galilee. Jesus is risen. He supposedly appears to them in some way, visionary-wise. And it says, they all worshipped, but some doubted. Hmm. They're right there with Jesus, and they doubted. You're reading a text that is thousands of years removed, not original autographs, scribal transmissions with errors and... Go to any textual critic and you'll see. Yeah. My point is, is you're going to tell me you shouldn't doubt? Hmm. This is why I said in the fourth gospel that Jesus breaks the fourth wall. It's like he's saying, Thomas, you see and you touch, and that's why you believe. But blessed are you. Right. Jesus winks <laughs> because you see. Or because, blessed are you who don't see because you're not going to. And don't touch because you're not going to but still believe with his flowing golden locks of hair. (laughs) But like, I love everything you said there and there's that trust. So when we hear the, they want to reverse the role and go, Oh no, you act like you're not biased. We all have them. Of course. My God. But we're not approaching it as, we need to trust Monk. And trust me, I see atheists out there that do the reversal. Sure, sure. Anything Monk says, I'm just not going to believe. And it's like, dude, stop. I'm approaching this going, what seems to be the easiest answer? The guy's cheating on you. The lipstick. Oh, and guess what? You weren't noticing this. I went through his phone and found there's six numbers by females that he's met with at different locations. I checked his credit card. Guess what's also... Apologists aren't even noticing all of that stuff. They've ignored the, the... the, the, the telephone numbers on the phone, the credit card sheets. And, and, and a good example of this or comparison of this would be that you, well, you know, let's say that you're another woman and you're telling this girlfriend, well, he's over there cheating on you. And I've got all this evidence. And she says to you, nah, you just want to date. You just want him for yourself. Right. I'm not even going to look at your evidence. I don't believe you fabricated because you have a bias. Right. You want to date him yourself. I can't trust you. I hear this all the time, like a a standard trope uh, when I go to Clubhouse, for example, is uh, to hear, well, I mean, liberal scholars, it doesn't matter what data I present. It's like they don't care because 
if it's not coming from a conservative evangelical scholar, they just conclude that I'm the spawn of Satan and I have this ax to grind where I have to prove atheism. Let me just clue you in. I don't give a fuck. If there turns out to be a God tomorrow, hey, that's awesome. Like, I don't care. That's not the point. We need to be able to try, try hard to set our biases aside and say, let's come to the data as, as neutrally as we can. My wife is a Christian. Like, she's a theist, people. And I love my wife and I think she's brilliant. And I don't think she's irrational at all for her belief. It's just, she looks at the data and says, this is likely. And I look at it and go, eh. I'm not really, I don't think it is likely, right? Mm -hmm. But I, like, I just, it's, I have no dog in this fight. So, yeah, I think. Um, One note on that, and then I want to wrap the bow on your story. And I'm making it this very brief, is that liberal scholarship. I was conservative like you. It was in my myth vision journey and in interviewing Christopher D. Stanley and others who are experts on Paul and showing how the New Testament is using the Old Testament, but isn't using it the way it was. They were liberal in their interpretation and how they wanted to mean what they wanted to use it to mean. Yeah. So they were very liberal in how they were quoting the Bible yeah. to make their, their points. That was a shocker to me. Even as a non-believer for at least a, a year and a half by then, when I first heard this, I was like, the New Testament authors were liberal. And we're over here trying to go, well, that text says, and it means what it says. And it's like, actually, no. But you, your bubbles popped. You're asking colleagues. And so now you've written, can you show everybody these books here? Because you've taken, there's more to these books than what meets the eye. I mean, obviously, you can see you've got Atheist Handbook 1 and 2. You're working on 3. You've mm -hmm. got several books on slavery because these are pertinent topics. Yeah, I see a lot of where you were. And you're answering Joshua Bowen, the old Joshua Bowen, mm. in these books. Yeah. And I see that I do the same thing. When I'm out here addressing, there are people I know that think this way. But I'm really talking about me yeah. and where I was. So wrap up the bow of your journey and where you're at now. Yeah. So the Bible, you realize, looks man-made, looks like other myths. You start to become more like, I need evidence to believe there is a God. I need evidence to believe this is the God kind of position now, yeah. right? I think what I would say characterizes where I am today and how that journey is. During the rest of my time at Hopkins, for the most part, it wasn't a concern. It wasn't a concern of any of the faculty. It wasn't really a concern of uh, my own my own study. You know, whether the God of the Bible was true and it was just, it wasn't relevant. I, we didn't have time to think about those sorts of things. It came up in discussions with my friend Caleb, but... Like generally speaking, it was just it it didn't it didn't really come up. Where I am today, I'm not like out here being an anti theist or something. Mm -hmm. I know that my book is called the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, primarily because it's it's geared toward atheists and skeptics who are arguing with fundamentalist evangelical Christians. That's who um, I'm interested in, in engaging with. And the reason that I'm interested in engaging with fundamentalist evangelicals is because they're one of the groups that believes that they have the correct interpretation of the text. And because of that, they will work very hard to make sure that everybody they can is held to their beliefs, right? Uh, just today, Frank Turek tweeted something about uh, should like why should like uh, what are the reasons the good reasons assuming that like he, he assumes that they should why should Christians try to legislate their morality and that's scary to me right because this fundamentalist evangelical view of the text has to defend slavery right they either have to figure out a way to get the text to say that it doesn't talk about slavery that it doesn't talk about genocide that it doesn't talk about rape it doesn't talk about sexual slavery but like it has to go into all these things because they're taking this view of the text that says this is the inspired inerrant word of god in its originals and we have reliable copies here and this is god's word and what he says is true and therefore we should like love the sinner and hate the sin but homosexuality is awful and we need to outlaw it and we need to outlaw. We need to keep make sure that trans people don't have rights and we need to make sure that this is the approach 
that I think needs to change because interpretations, there's nothing wrong with people having different interpretations of ancient texts. There's nothing wrong with people having interpretations of anything. The problem is when someone says, my interpretation is right and I'm gonna make sure that you are held to it. That's what I'm out here against because if people could say, well, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be dogmatic and say that my interpretation is the right one. You, you have your interpretive model and that works for you. I have mine that works for us. We're gonna focus on humanitarian. We're gonna focus on being good humanists. We're gonna focus on working for the betterment of society based on what benefits uh, people like and have those ethical discussions from that perspective, not saying this 2000, 23 year old, 2300 year old book says X, therefore that's what we have to do. That's what I'm out here trying to do is bring people into that more liberal Christianity. If people could say I'm not a fundamentalist anymore, I would consider my job well done because liberal Christians don't try to restrict the rights of others in my experience. Get his books, sign up for his course on MVP courses, MVP dash courses. And uh, thank you, Dr. Josh. Thank you.